Uma, can you hear me? I just checked that this uh, that I am being heard. Yeah, I can hear you. Um. Okay, great. I can't can I can't see that anybody's typing in the box, so I'm just wondering if people can hear me. Can people hear me? <laughs> <laughs> ah, here we go. Great. Oh, Sarah, you've got loads of people with you, <laughs> or oh, Sarah. <laughs> Great, good, in a man, great, coming loud and clear, great. Good. Oh, wow. <laughs> can't hear me, I was just wondering if maybe, uh, maybe it wasn't working. I'll try and get it so you guys can speak, because it's going to be a little bit quiet, if not. Um, what I'll do just to start with, though, is just to introduce myself and Uma. So I am Gemma Prescott, and I'm the project manager working for CHS Alliance. And I'm project managing the, the rollout of this core humanitarian competency framework and the competency based HR approach. Um, um, I'm working with Uma. Uma, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi, hi everyone. My name is Uma. I'm based in Kuala Lumpur. I've been working on these competencies framework for almost uh, two years now, starting with the review of the previous version. So it's really nice uh, to have all of you on board and look forward uh, to the session. Thank you. Back to you, Jim. Thank you. Sorry, you're saying that the, the screen's not connecting, I think. I'm going to do an introduction for five minutes and then hopefully it will um, it might have connected by the time that, that I finish that because we, you don't need the, the, the PowerPoint for this first part. Um, so, yeah, the presentation we think will take around 20 minutes and then there'll be sort of 15, 20 minutes at the end for questions. If questions come into your mind as we go through the content, just type them into the box at the bottom. Um, and I'll make sure that the questions posed at the end uh, to Uma and myself and we'll hopefully give some clarity on, on what it is that you're wondering. The session's not going to be hugely interactive and in fact if I can't get you to talk it's going to be really uninteractive um, but the idea here is that it's, it's just information really that we're going to pass on to you um, and then the idea is that the training that you come to next week in a man will be really practical um, and be over to you uh, a lot of the time kind of really engaging with you so this is more of a an introduction um, so you won't have to be too interactive on this one um, I'll mute you as well whilst uh, Uma's doing the presentation um, and that's just so there's no background noise uh, so before we start I wanted to cover a couple of questions that you might have in your mind firstly why is the CHS Alliance promoting this and then secondly, where has the core humanitarian competency framework come from? From this point, I'll call it the CHCF because it's a bit of a mouthful. So firstly, the Alliance. So we are supporting and promoting this framework because we feel we're running the webinar and training in several different countries. So far, we've been to uh, Bangladesh twice and we've been to Manila. We're obviously coming to Jordan next week and then we're hoping to be in Nairobi in September as well, possibly DRC. Um, we're doing this because we feel that if organisations can use these, use the framework and use a competency based approach to HR, it's actually going to help them to commit, uh, fulfil their commitment to the core humanitarian standard. And in particular, standard eight, which is all about staff and managing staff. If you can't remember it off by heart, it's staff are supported to do their job effectively and are treated fairly and equitably. So we feel that by promoting this, that we can help organisations to support, uh, to fulfil their commitment to this standard and then in turn directly support communities and people affected by crisis. So that's why we're involved in it. And then just to give you a little bit of background about why, uh, where the framework came from. So it's actually been around since 2010. It, it was uh, in that year that about 15 NGOs came together. They decided that they, they wanted one core set of competences. There are many, many uh, sets of competences, mostly internal documents that were floating around, but they felt in order for the sector to come together more, they needed one core set. So they went into negotiation and consultation globally. Um, and these 15 organizations worked pretty hard to pull together one 
generic agreed set of competences. Those NGOs actually went on to become the start network, interestingly enough, and they've done a lot of work since then. But to start with, it was it was focused on the um, CHCF. So they agreed on on the behaviours that they thought were the most appropriate to display in order for response to be effective. And then it was utilised by these organisations since 2010, they've been using it. Last year, uh, the, the Alliance, along with the START Network again, decided to have a look to see how much it was being used still. Um, and UMA completed a piece of work, which again was globally, uh, was a global, had a global scope to it approached many, many different organisations and got the results back that ascertained it was still being used. It was still very relevant and very useful for organisations. However, it wasn't being promoted as much as it possibly could be, and it wasn't as accessible. People didn't know quite how to use it, how this framework tied in with, with HR practices. And that's where this project was born from, really, was to, to bridge that gap. Um, so now we're working with the START Network, so we're supported by the START Network, but also the Humanitarian Leadership Academy have become involved and they're supporting this work also. Uh, they have centres in most of the countries that we're working and they're very keen to promote uh, the CHCF and the competency-based approaches in general as well. So that's what the project is uh, about and that's why we're doing the work. So I'll pass over to Uma now, who's going to really get into what it is that we're doing. Hi, Gemma. Can you see uh, the screen? Yeah, we can see that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can hear me well. Yeah, loud and clear. OK, welcome, everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like you to reflect on a couple of points as we go through the presentations. Uh, what competencies does your organization need, whether it's core competencies, whether it is technical competencies or leadership competencies? And in your mind, who is accountable to develop competent staff? Is it you yourself or is it the management? Is it the leadership of the organization? And finally, why do we need competency based HR practices? Why can't we stick with the convention? No HR practices, what's so different about competency-based HR practices that could add value to our world? So with that, welcome to this introduction session. Basically, when we talk about competent staff, we need competent staff simply because, and you may agree with, uh, with me on that, the actions of the staff are the foundation and basis for effective response. You and I have heard of cases where staff behavior was causing more harm than good in the community. As such, having competency staff, and this is also my personal view, is not an obligation or choice. It is a commitment. It is a commitment that we as agencies are responsible uh, to provide competent staff so that agencies could provide effective service to the uh, affected communities. Now, some of you may be familiar with the core humanitarian standard, this is in line with the commitment number eight, which talks about staff competencies. This is also in sync with the localization agenda, where initiatives are underway to enable more local led responses. For those of you who have been involved in uh, programs uh, such as uh, the humanitarian trainee scheme or the contacts or the leadership uh, program uh, led by Relief International, you may be aware that these core competencies are being reflected in the course modules. And for those of you who are HR uh, and managers as well, you may agree also that staff related costs are often the largest proportion of an organization's cost and of most program budget. Therefore, investment uh, in staff should be carefully nurtured if they are to yield the best outcomes for communities affected by the crisis. So the, the core humanitarian competencies uh, framework, when we talk about the definition itself, competencies are defined as um, behaviors that employees must have or must acquire. And this is informed by skills and knowledge in order to achieve high levels of performance. You may note that the emphasis here is on behaviors. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is informed by skills and 
uh, knowledge. Uh, during the uh, 2010, when the competency framework was first developed, uh, it was uh, agreed that the focus will be very much on behaviours because one of the aims was to professionalise the sector and to ensure that um, the aid workers are equipped with a certain sets of behaviour that is very necessary for effective response. So when we look at this core humanitarian competencies framework, there are six domains altogether. And the first one is understanding humanitarian context and applying humanitarian principles and standards. So the outcome of this domain is basically for aid workers to understand operating contexts, uh, key stakeholders, and practices affecting uh, the current and future humanitarian interventions. And this is also, um, in doing so, adhering to the humanitarian principles and standards. That includes the principles of humanity, neutrality, uh, universality and whatnot. So these are uh, common principles and critical uh, to the work uh, of humanitarian. Some of you may ask that could it uh, apply to development work? So basically the competency framework is pretty much geared towards humanitarian work. However, it can be modified, it can be adapted to suit the context of development work or organizations that are dual mandated. So for domain number one, for example, it could be understanding development context and applying certain principles that are critical for development work. So the second uh, domain is basically about achieving results. It's uh, talking about uh, the um, role of the aid workers to be accountable for their work and uh, focusing also on using resources effectively. And this is also about uh, the knowledge of program management, project uh, cycle management, how they complete uh, project cycle management in a proper way, and also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the need to use uh, resources effectively. The third domain is basically about uh, coordination and collaboration. And as you, as some of you who are familiar with uh, conflict uh, situations or emergency response during disaster, you may recognize that one of the main challenges during this uh, response is coordination and collaboration. And that could happen at all levels, national level, sometimes regional level as well. Recognizing the need to address this gap, this competency aims to develop and maintain collaborative and coordinated relationship with uh, stakeholders and staff. So if these um, behaviors under this particular domain are adopted and are practiced, we are hoping that in years to come, coordination and collaboration among stakeholders will, will drastically improve for the benefit of the communities. The fourth one, operating safely and securely at all times, is pretty much focused on um, organizational level. It talks a little bit about uh, the role of organization in ensuring safety and security. And this is not only internal safety and security, it's also about how do you uh, think or how do you uh, ensure that your programs are not causing more harm? How do you ensure that your programs are taking into consideration safety and secu security of uh, communities, for example? Uh, managing yourself in a pressured and changing environment. This particular domain is focused on uh, very much at individual level. And uh, for those of you, particularly in Jordan, and I believe uh, given the Syrian uh, refugee crisis as well, probably a lot of you are working in a constantly changing and pressured environment. So this particular domain, it lists a behavior that adapts to pressure, that adapts to changing environment, a very important one. I just want to note that I have been in the sector for almost 20 years. 10 years ago, we don't hear too much about safety and security or stress management or uh, managing in a bridged environment for aid workers. Perhaps there weren't too much attention either in terms of um, resources as well as awareness uh, for both uh, these domain four and five. But you can see increasingly many organizations are paying attention uh, to these uh, aspects. The last one, the last domain, it talks about demonstrating uh, leadership in humanitarian uh, context. And this one pretty much focuses on leadership uh, qualities or competencies. Uh, it's important to note that this is not necessarily 
uh, focusing on only leadership position, but it is uh, focusing on those who have to demonstrate leadership competencies in the positions that they assume, regardless of seniority or the title of the position. The competency framework uses two-tiered approach, and it is uh, focusing for, uh, on, on behaviors for all staff to adapt. And then there are additional behaviors where uh, managers are expected to demonstrate uh, the behaviors. And I think that is where, as managers, naturally they are expected to uh, demonstrate additional behaviors. So those are the six uh, particular, uh, six uh, competency domain. When we uh, meet you in Jordan, uh, we will have more exercises, practical exercises and engagements for you to become familiar if you're not familiar with the competency domain. You will find as we go along um, during the training also in Jordan, you will find that quite a number or rather majority of the competencies and the behaviors listed under the sub competencies are not unfamiliar to you. You probably adapt it in different ways in your organizations, either through your own competency framework, through leadership competency framework, or through various different uh, HR practices and HR procedures that you have in the organization. So the idea is basically uh, to ensure that there is a, a formal, a structured way of building uh, competencies within the organization. That's the main purpose also uh, of the competency framework. So let's look at some of the competency-based HR practices. We didn't uh, focus on all the um, HR practices. We just focused on four areas, namely planning and organizational assessment, recruitment and selection, performance development, and then learning and development. I will briefly describe how each practice uh, incorporates the competencies and the benefits of doing so. So when we talk about uh, planning and organizational design, um, HR planning is a crucial step, and some of you uh, may agree with me, uh, sometimes this is done in an ad hoc manner, or at times HR is hardly involved in the planning stage for whatever reason. So a competency-based approach to HR planning would include the typical steps of planning, however, with the focus of analyzing where their competencies gap. And as I mentioned earlier, it could be core competencies, it could be technical competencies, or it could be leadership competencies, depending on the organization's need. So uh, in terms of the uh, organizational uh, planning and organizational design, it also focuses on identifying your future staffing needs. Not only what you have now, but what competencies will you need for the future in three years to come uh, for some of your organizations in, in based in Amman. Are these the are the existing competencies uh, sufficient? Would you need some additional competencies or would you need to focus on other competencies in three years to come or four years to come or, um, or, or the future in general? So it's, it's basically looking at the gaps between your future workforce needs and the current, current uh, staffing profile. And based on that, create a plan and also uh, create actions or develop actions to take uh, to close these uh, competency gaps. For these, you, you can see that there are a few uh, tools. We have developed some tools and that include organizational assessment. So there's a template uh, for you to use. There's also talent management succession plan template, as well as learning and development plan and competency-based job description. Uh, as I mentioned again, some of you may already have some of these tools and these tools are for you to use and um, perhaps if it is um, different or if it is uh, um, in a way suitable for the organization, then uh, you can use uh, these tools. And the second one is uh, competency-based uh, recruitment and uh, selection, pretty much um, a majority uh, part of what HR does uh, in, in most cases, especially during uh, emergencies. So competency-based approach uh, could make recruitment systems fairer and more open. And differences between levels, job titles, and grades are also made uh, more transparent. So uh, competency frameworks uh, statistics have shown that it plays a major role in both attracting and retaining staff, particularly when linked to career progression and pay. And uh, when a new staff join, it is also very clear 
what competencies are required for that particular job and people who apply, they can also be tested on the competencies, for example, uh, during the uh, using the motivation letter or the application form or even during the interviews. So hiring decisions in a way are made uh, more objectively with behavior based shortlisting and interviewing, which is not so easy, even in my experience of interviewing uh, many positions, sometimes it's not so easy to test or to assess the behavior. How can you actually assess people if they are honest during interview? How can you assess if they have certain integrity? Or um, how do you do that? So these interview, competency-based interview uh, questionnaire, and, uh, questionnaire and guideline, and we also have a list of um, interview uh, question bank, though they provide uh, some guidance for HR uh, practitioners as well as managers to identify the key behaviors that you require uh, for that particular position. So these uh, question, interview questions, they directly correspond to the behaviors listed, listed uh, in the core competencies framework. Uh, in Jordan, when we have the training, uh, we uh, hope to practice um, uh, practice these uh, competency-based interview questioning as well as uh, perhaps group assessment if we have the time and depending on the final list of participants as well. And the tool also includes reference questions. So sometimes we have reference uh, template where we randomly ask, what is the strength of the star? What is the strength of the uh, candidate? What, what, what are the maybe challenges? And sometimes the questions are not targeted towards identifying the specific strengths in the competencies that we are looking for. So these reference questions uh, template pretty much focuses on guiding the users in uh, adapting uh, questions uh, to, to um, specifically identify the competencies that they are looking for. So the next one is competency-based performance management. Uh, how do we know, for example, if managers and staff are performing? I think um, if I um, uh, can recall based on my own uh, work that I have done in the region, mostly in Asia, sometimes organizations struggle to measure the performance of the staff. Uh, either because there's a lack of uh, system, lack of tool, or also lack of uh, culture of uh, measuring performance. So how do we know if the managers and staff are performing and if they are demonstrating the core competencies, the technical competencies, or the leadership competencies as desired? So the focus of this competency-based performance management is not only on the what, and it's also on the how, and this is where the core competencies uh, come in play. The core competencies, uh, co competency-based performance management, it helps to identify the competencies for effective performance on specific role. And we, uh, under this, we have developed several tools, and that includes self-assessment tool, again, using the six core competencies and competency-based objective template. How do you develop competency-based objective and also personal development plan? How do you actually list down or develop a personal uh, plan uh, that is uh, related to your, uh, let's say, gaps uh, in terms of the competencies? So these tools are also available uh, for uh, free. And last, uh, lastly, it's competency-based learning and development. Uh, most of you may agree uh, with me that uh, many organizations, including perhaps some of the uh, partner organizations that you work with, sometimes uh, they send staff to training. Sometimes it can be very random, or it can be uh, focusing only on the program staff who go for the training and less so for support services to go for training. So learning and development whilst is the biggest investment in organizations, in some organizations and in many programs, it's not often strategically carried out. It's not often structured. So staff development, uh, competency-based learning and development uh, primarily focus on supporting the strategic uh, direction of the organization by developing the skills and competencies needed for the future. So in order to, to have a structured competency-based uh, learning and development system, it's uh, key that uh, first the organization identifies uh, the skills and competencies that they need currently as well as for the future. Uh, 
And in so doing, it also addresses the challenges of having to randomly send staff for trainings. And, and uh, the staff development obviously is approved by manager and second line managers. So usually, um, as I mentioned earlier, forms and formats are just uh, formalities. And, some, and sometimes there are no conscious or conscientious decision to identify competency gap and build competencies accordingly. So competency-based learning and development addresses that challenge and pretty much uh, try to help organization to uh, be more structured in terms of developing uh, the competencies that they uh, desire. And under this, uh, we have a competency-based uh, coaching tool since coaching uh, is one of the um, uh, successful practices these days in terms of building competencies. So there's a tool uh, under this, which is competency-based coaching. Uh, the uh, tool shared earlier may also apply uh, for this uh, section. So all in all, uh, all in all, uh, we also have a couple of other tools. Uh, the first one is limiting behaviors. Sometimes uh, we have we can list you know a couple of behaviors that we expect people to demonstrate this is you know a perfect behavior good behavior but we we cannot identify limiting behaviors for example so the list of limiting behaviors in a way gives you a comparison of what you can expect when things go well or when the staff is behaving well and what can you expect when that are limiting behaviors. And also, um, in addition to that, we have a communication plan and business case. As you know, any change in the organization and introducing competency framework is not a very straightforward um, change as such, would require some convincing uh, either from the management or the leadership or even from HR uh, to have the buy-in. So the communication plan and business case um, uh, tools and guide help uh, organization or rather the HR uh, to build a strong case as to why HR uh, competency based HR should be adopted in the organization. And uh, we have uh, also uh, developed or in the midst of finalizing the training modules to build these core competencies. As I mentioned earlier, we have uh, trainings on using the core competencies to recruit and select people, uh, core competencies to do self-assessment. So all those training modules, uh, along with the exercises that we developed for the uh, training, will be also included under these uh, tools. Uh, obviously, there are also other references. Basically, uh, what we are saying is uh, we would want the organizations, and particularly HR, uh, to be given or to be provided with all the necessary how-to so that uh, they can feel comfortable, confident in using uh, the competency framework. So with that, uh, I would also like to share the benefits of the uh, core humanitarian uh, competencies framework. Personally, I have seen some positive changes with those who have used a competency framework effectively. And I, and I emphasize effectively. Uh, sometimes if you um, do not know how to use competency framework, that can go down quite badly. I, I know of organizations who have paid thousands of dollars um, with consulting firm to develop competency framework, but after a while, this is not communicated or understood very well by staff, and then it just remains a tool. So just like any tool, this competency framework also has its advantages and uh, disadvantages. But in terms of the benefits, it is a free tool to support the professionalization of the sector as such. And particularly, uh, we are keen to focus in supporting the smaller organizations. Large organizations, they have an HR team, they have uh, probably enough resources and even HR has uh, sufficient authority in the organization to make changes. But smaller organizations who are uh, more and more becoming the frontline organizations, sometimes they don't even have HR team, they don't have proper systems, proper practices. So we're very committed to support uh, these organizations as well. Uh, so if you have any partner organizations that you think would benefit from uh, such kind of briefing and webinars between now and September, uh, we would be very happy to support uh, for free. So I uh, personally uh, believe that the um, 
benefits of this framework when used effectively, it outweigh the limitations. Um, as I mentioned earlier, building a competency framework from scratch can be a daunting task. So the uh, core competencies framework, it provides like a, it provides um, a reference for you. It's like a, a starting point for some organizations so they can they can choose which competencies are suitable and then they can um, develop or prioritize the competencies relevant for the organization so as i mentioned earlier the framework is a free tool that you can use as it is or if you um, if you want you can um, uh, modify it to suit your organization's need as well as your organization's mandate uh, the um, competencies, uh, for, uh, resources, the tools, and all the other resources that I mentioned, it allows organization to start small, especially if they are unfamiliar with the use of competency framework. So recently, I was in Bangladesh working with a small organization, but very heavily engaged um, as a frontline organization um, during emergency response, and they didn't uh, have any a structured or formal, let's say, uh, job description, competency-based job description, or um, proper interviewing uh, techniques or skills, or even interview questions. Uh, so most of the hiring is done very quickly or randomly. So I was just helping them uh, to review their job descriptions and to suggest uh, some of the competency-based job descriptions for some of the core positions and helping them to identify the competencies that they should focus on and then the type of interview questions that they should ask. So the idea is we don't expect all organization to make changes at all levels. It really depends on the resources, on the willingness, as well as the technical ability as well. Um, with that, uh, all in all, um, these uh, resources will be made um, uh, will be made uh, available on the website and for now we have the core humanitarian competencies framework available in English, French, Bengali, um, Tagalog and Swahili. English one I think is very good version. I'm not so sure about the French, Bengali, Tagalog as such. Um, so we are still uh, finalizing the translation. Uh, translated versions and there will also be a how to guide meaning how can you use core competencies framework and uh, earlier on I mentioned the training modules and in addition there will be an introductory video about core competencies uh, framework. Uh, we ourselves will be available for technical assistance until September or end of September this year meaning that after the training in Jordan should you need some more advice we will provide it over um, long distance support. So with that I'm going to hand it over to uh, Gemma. Hi, thanks, Uma. That was brilliant. Um, so if you guys have got any questions about anything that we that Uma's just covered or that I've covered, please do pop a little note in the chat box. Um, and I figured out that actually I think it's I'm going to unmute you all. So it's you're on self mute. So if you want to speak, just please unmute yourself and speak. Um, I've been having a little bit of a chat down the bottom uh, with Ayas about attending the training. Um, AS was just wondering whether it's okay for, for them to attend, which it is, especially if you're in a HR position, which they are. Um, we're, we're just looking for people that are either involved in people management or HR. Really, as you can tell by the content of the presentation, uh, HR is, is our focus. Uh, we're, we want people to try our tools and we want people to see how the CHCF works for them and how it might fit into their organisation. That's, that's what we require. Um, and we'd also like feedback after the session. And then if you do use the tools uh, in your operations, we'd love feedback after that. Part of the project um, for us is, is to help embed the tools. So there is, uh, Uma and I do have time offline post training to give advice either on Skype or call or just through email on, on how to ha how to embed these tools. So there is uh, secondary support after the training as well, just so just so you guys are aware. So I'm not getting any questions so far. 
I think one thing that Uma and I might be interested to know if, if you could fill us in would be to know what if any um, particular HR issues you guys are, are coming up against within Jordan and the Middle East we got quite different responses to this from from Bangladesh and from Philippines and I think we do expect to get quite different responses from Jordan because your organizations are obviously fully operational at the moment we had a little bit of feedback to suggest that staff well-being might be an issue and and for HR people uh, having to deal with with staff well-being is possibly quite a challenging area but if you could let us know that would be great maybe just put a little chat down the bottom um, or just unmute yourself and just pose the question now somebody has to ask something come on don't be shy I'll give you a couple of minutes to get brave okay while we're waiting um, I will just let you know. So the training next week, um, we've confirmed it as the Geneva Hotel, which looks very nice. We'll be providing tea and coffee and lunch. And um, we're going to start at nine o'clock. Uh, I presume that's OK with everybody. You just come to reception and report your name um, and say that you're here for the CHS Alliance training and uh, they'll tell you where to go. I'll send an email as well with all the instructions on there. We've got a question there. No, no questions yet. <laughs> um, I will also say with the joining instructions, I'll include copies of the framework, which you might be interested to see it now. We've actually translated one into Arabic, which we'd like feedback on. It's not a final version. So if you could possibly uh, give feedback on that, have a look over it. And if you see any if you see any big obvious mistakes on that, we'd be open to feedback. But I'll send that through. Um, I'll also send you a link to this video because we have been recording it if you wanted to share it with colleagues or just re-watch it. The idea of running this session is that when we get to the training we don't have to spend too much on this background and the whole day can be really practical. That's that's our aim. Um, okay, Amar is hoping that he can come from Turkey. We're hoping to, we're hoping to, Amar. Fingers crossed. I don't think the flight will be too much. Surely you can convince your uh, manager to, to let you fly over, but we'll see, we'll see. We have a space for you if you want to come. Uh, and then the other bit of follow up that I just wanted to chat about briefly was the website that Uma mentioned that will be online, hopefully with, towards the end of the month. It'll have all the tools on there. It'll have the guide on there. Um, it's going to have a short video, which would be really useful if you wanted to introduce it to your organization. Just an, a, a cartoon animation just to explain what it is uh, in practical terms, what the framework is and what it looks like. Uh, there'll also be a section for employees that are interested to know what it means and for career development links. So what courses could you do if you're interested in, in getting into the sector or developing in a particular area, uh, a particular day, domain in the framework, which providers offers, offer courses, most of them free as well, uh, just to develop yourself in the certain areas. So that will be online towards the end of the month. OK, we have another question. Oh, yes, I will send you the slip. Yeah, I'll send them today, Emma. I'll, I'll send you the, the information today. OK, if we're not going to have any questions, by email, yes, by email. I will send them by email. Um, give it another few moments. If there's no other questions, I'll close the webinar for today. Emma, you might be able to speak, actually. No, you've gone self-muted. <laughs> You're very shy. OK, good. NRC is waiting for the email. That's good. Yeah, I'll send that through so you've, you've all got it. OK, if you haven't already, could you please just drop down your name um, and your email address and organisation, just so I know who's attended this and I can make sure that you do get the invite if you haven't already, because there's a few names there that I haven't seen. So it would be great to uh, to know who that who, who you are uh, and I can forward the invite on to you. So if you can just let me know uh, email address, organization and name. Yeah, I'll send through more details on the training if I haven't got your email already, if you haven't received that. OK, so. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Jade. <laughs> uh, I think I'll wrap it up there. I'll leave the I'll leave the chat open so you guys can just put your email addresses in. That'd be really useful. Um, and then I guess the next time we will meet will be in uh, Amman next week. So very excited to uh, meet you all. 
So thank you, Uma, for the presentation and thanks to everyone who's attended today. We really appreciate you giving up this time. Okay, thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. See you, Gemma. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Amar. Bye. 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 Thank you for... Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye.